Hi, it's Katrina. Liar tail pleco. While this fish might look like an alien, it is actually a species of armored catfish native to the Colombian Amazon and Orinoco basins. With its feathered face and gills, fins that look like wings, spines, and enormous thighs, these fish look like real river monsters. These liar tail plecos are usually black or dark brown, but sometimes white ones have been found, which may be albino. They can reach up to three and a half feet long and are known for being very aggressive, so they are not common in aquariums. Several forums mention that if you do want to keep one, you should probably keep it alone in a very big tank. This fish is not only aggressive, but territorial and even outright homicidal. You have been warned. Julian Dignall of PlanetCatfish.com says that they also become more aggressive with age, and that one source reports repeatedly trying to add small fish to hang out with his pleco, but it would wait at the edge of the tank and impale the little fish with his opercular spines against the glass. It wouldn't eat the fish, it reportedly just wanted them dead. While not a predator, this seems unlikely given the carnivorous tendencies of this species. Bumphead Sunfish in 1996, scientists captured the heaviest bony fish that they'd ever found. It clocked in at an astounding 5,070 pounds. At first, they weren't sure what species this creature was, but they later classified it as Mola alexandrini, also known as the bumphead sunfish, a creature that had never been seen before. For a long time, everyone thought this fish was the Mola Mola, but it was a new species. Sunfish are extremely heavy fish with bony skeletons, which you might think is normal. However, lots of aquatic creatures don't have bony skeletons like ours, but are held together by different kinds of cartilage. These fish are huge and round, the flapjacks of the sea, and can grow to be over 10 feet long. However, due to their size, it can be a serious problem trying to capture and investigate them safely. In 2004, fishermen from Japan caught a fish that was 10.9 feet long. It was an M. alexandrini, but they didn't weigh it. It took some serious advances in genetic analysis before scientists knew just how many sunfish were in the sea. This groundbreaking research enabled scientists to determine that there were a lot more kinds of sunfish out there than they first thought. There is much to still be discovered out in the ocean. Frilled Shark The frilled shark is a strange-looking prehistoric shark that lives deep in the ocean. Only two species of the shark have been discovered, and it has changed little in the 80 million years it has been around, so scientists call them living fossils. Fishermen off Australia got quite the shock when they found one in their net. It was like a large eel, probably one and a half meters long, and the body was quite different to any other shark I'd ever seen. Fisherman David Gillot tells 3AW Radio. The head on it was like something out of a horror movie. It was quite horrific looking. Frilled sharks are named for their six pairs of gills, the first pair of which extends around their throats completely. And then you've got those teeth. Just take a look inside of its mouth. It's got 25 rows of teeth in total, and all 300 of them are razor sharp with three prongs. They are pretty much perfect for grabbing a hold of something and not letting go. The more a fish wrestles to get out, the more entangled it will get on the shark's teeth. Little is known about this fascinating species since they are usually found so deep below the surface, probably around several hundred to several thousand feet. The only one caught alive died soon after it was put into a pool full of seawater. Its long serpent shape makes scientists think that they might go after their prey just like snakes do. They might use their back fins to push themselves in the direction of their prey and lunge out into the darkness with one swift strike. Since frilled sharks have such huge jaws, they might also be able to open them extra wide and take in gigantic prey. While no one's ever seen a frilled shark on the hunt, they are probably one of the most intimidating predators in the deep sea. Diamond Squid When a scuba diver was exploring off the coast of Australia, he spotted a massive long thing that looked like a slinky and glowed in the dark. While it sort of looks like a pyrosome, there was something more to it. What was this enormous thing? A sea monster? Turns out, it's not actually an animal. Instead, when scientists looked closer, they determined that the sea slinky was actually a gigantic collection of eggs from a species of squid that scientists don't know much about, the elusive diamond squid. This large mass doesn't have a solid outside like you'd expect. Instead, it's a collection of a string of squid eggs forming a transparent structure. The glowing pink blobs in between are the eggs themselves. It's such a rare occurrence that whoever finds this should be really excited. Not only is a collection of eggs this large an unlikely sight, but it came from an even more elusive creature. 
Rebecca Helm, a biologist at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in Massachusetts, said that these egg masses are incredibly rare. If I were there, I would have been screaming with joy through my regulator. I hope the divers know what a lucky sighting this was. The mysterious diamond squid, also known as the diamondback squid, are named for their kite or diamond-shaped triangular fins. Surprisingly, they have been observed to be found in pairs, making scientists believe that they might be monogamous. If one is caught, the other will stay nearby, which is not great since they are a popular squid to eat. These squid grow to around 3 feet long and weigh around 53 pounds. They are known to lay egg cases like this one, which can contain up to 43,800 eggs. However, once they're released, they have to fend for themselves. The species develops rapidly and is estimated to only live up to a year. To date, only about 24 of these enormous egg masses have been recorded worldwide. Sea Angel Sea angels are proof that the ocean is unbelievably mysterious and full of things we can barely even imagine. These floating sea angels can be found all over the world in cold waters, but even when you see it with your own eyes, it still almost doesn't look real. These creatures look like something out of a fantasy novel, but they're actually a type of sea snail, which is a strange and wonderful class of animals. They live all over the world's oceans, but most notably right in the middle of the Antarctic seas. Their bodies are almost completely see-through, and they don't grow to be very large. In fact, the biggest species of sea angel is only about two and a half inches long. In 2016, thousands invaded North Carolina beaches, probably due to strong winds and currents. They're called angels because of the strange wing-like organs they have extending from their bodies. While they are harmless to humans, they aren't as gentle as real angels. They're voracious carnivores, feeding on shelled sea butterflies by turning them inside out. Sea angels can swim at nearly double the speed of sea butterflies, so they're an easy target. They shoot them with a form of mucus that renders them immobile, and then they dig in, angels versus butterflies, but not in a good way. In turn, baleen whales love eating sea angels. Another weird fact about sea angels is that all of them start out their lives as males and evolve into females over their lifetimes, kind of like clownfish. In order to mate, they flip their reproductive organs inside out and stick themselves onto one another, and then they pirouette through the ocean for a few hours while the babies form. You can check out this mystifying dance for yourself. Deep Sea Lizardfish When scientists were looking for different kinds of sea creatures off the coast of eastern Australia, they certainly weren't expecting to find the deep sea lizardfish, which turned out to be the most deep living predator in the world. The technical name is Bathysaurus ferox, which translates to fierce deep sea lizard. The deep sea lizardfish is downright terrifying, and they have the appetite to prove it. They generally live at depths between 3,300 and 8,200 feet below the surface of the ocean, where they then bury themselves deep into the ocean floor. No sunlight can penetrate such deep waters, and these animals have adapted to living in the darkness. This fish is an ambush predator, waiting in the darkness until it senses movement and then it will lunge forward, grabbing its prey with its searing teeth. This thing also has an absurdly powerful bite. There's really no way for anything to escape once it's trapped in the lizardfish's jaws. That's a terrifying way to go, although it is over quickly. Just like the sea angel, the deep sea lizardfish has both male and female reproductive organs. So anytime that one deep sea lizardfish meets another in the deep sea, they can mate with any partner they come across. It's a crazy world out there in the ocean, and these weird adaptations help these animals survive almost no matter what. In an environment like the deep ocean that's so hostile to life, this is an astounding evolutionary advantage. Squidworm this creepy, fascinating thing is not a squid and it's not a worm. But what is it? About a decade ago, scientists discovered a new species that they dubbed Tuthododrilus. They first discovered this strange-looking creature in the Celebes Sea between Indonesia and the Philippines, about 9,200 feet and 9,500 feet deep. It probably makes sense why this thing is called the squid worm. Just look at the tentacle-like things sprouting from its head. Each one of them is longer than its whole body. Why does it have these long appendages? Scientists think that it enables the squidworm to grab passing particles and plankton that it eats. Strangely enough, there were also a lot of them located in the same spot of the deep ocean, which is odd for creatures that live that far down. Although they have squid in their names, they are more worm. They're in the same phylum, annelid, with their cousins, the earthworm. The six pairs of sensory organs pop out from its head, which give it the ability to smell and taste. However, we still don't know much more about this species since we've only discovered it recently. 
but scientists think that it could be a kind of transition species between worms deep down in the ocean and worms closer to the surface. This could help scientists patch together a mysterious piece of evolutionary history. Number 2. Halitrephes Massey Jellyfish What is going on with the Halitrephes Massey Jellyfish? If you take a look at it, it looks more like a psychedelic poster than a real living animal. But I promise, it's real! Researchers recently took video of this strange jellyfish swimming through the waters around Baja California, Mexico at about 4,000 feet below the water. The team who captured this video said that its movement is like a bunch of deep sea fireworks moving through the jellyfish's body. They have a pretty good explanation for why this jellyfish emits a psychedelic display. They think that the colors are formed when canals throughout the jellyfish's body transmit nutrients through the jellyfish's bell, the head-like structure on top of its body. The transmission makes a wonderful array of light come into view, though it's likely that a part of the display caught on video was caused by a reflection of the light from the submarine that was watching the jellyfish. To this day, there isn't all that much information about the so-called firework jellyfish. Like other deep-sea creatures, they are incredibly difficult to spot given both their remoteness and rarity. But scientists are optimistic that they may be located in other parts of the world. We just have to keep an eye out for them. The Gulper Eel the gulper eel, also known as the pelican eel, is one of the strangest animals in the world. Their name is gulper eels because of their gigantic mouths, which can open up in a way that's strangely similar to a pelican. And they can change their shape in a flash. Like other strange ocean creatures, you'll find gulper eels swimming between 1,600 to 10,000 feet below the surface of the ocean. Because of this, they also have another feature that's relatively common to deep-sea creatures. They are bioluminescent, flashing pink and red lights in the dark. Bioluminescence is more common the further down you search, because below a certain depth, there is no seeing anything. The ocean turns pitch black, with predators around every corner. When there's no light from the sun, you might as well make your own! In order to move around, like most eels, the gulper wiggles its skinny body to swim through the water. The gulper eel, which grows up to 2.5 feet long, is best known for its huge, loosely hinged mouth, which is disproportionately large compared to its body and can open extremely wide, enabling the eel to swallow a fish larger than itself. Its jaw alone occupies an estimated one quarter of the creature's body length, but its teeth are very small. This evolutionary adaptation enables them to bring a ton of water into their mouths and completely inhale their prey, which is an easy way to sweep up tiny little creatures trying to escape. Although they tend to eat crustaceans, many researchers think that their mouths are so big that they could entirely swallow whole fish that are bigger than they are. However, sometimes their mouth is bigger than their stomach, and they eat prey that is too large for them that ends up getting stuck. First Swimming Dinosaur At up to 50 feet long and weighing as much as 7 tons, Spinosaurus aegyptiacus dwarfed the Tyrannosaurus rex. Known as one of the strangest dinosaurs ever discovered, it lived between 95 and 100 million years ago during the Cretaceous period and possessed an extremely long tail resembling a paddle. The scientists who discovered the remains of this unique feature in modern-day Morocco described it in the journal Nature as the most extreme aquatic adaptation ever seen in a large dinosaur. The creature's vertebrae contained struts extending as much as 2 feet, giving its tail an oar-like shape. Researchers believe the dinosaur propelled itself through the water by swaying its tail back and forth. This was basically a dinosaur trying to build a fishtail, lead researcher Nizar Ibrahim told National Geographic. Ibrahim and his colleagues argued in 2014 that the dinosaur was semi-aquatic, but their theory was met with backlash from other scholars who contended that Spinosaurus was strictly a land dweller. The discovery of the oddly shaped tail was a game changer to previous findings, however, providing the most solid evidence thus far that the species did, in fact, spend a sizable portion of its life in the water. Simply put, a tail of its kind would have no practical use on land, and its unique shape appears to be an evolutionary adaptation for navigating in a marine habitat. What do you think? Have you ever heard of this dinosaur before? Let me know in the comments below! Ancient Cemetery While hunting for dinosaur remains at a site called Gobero in Niger in 2000, a group of scientists led by University of Chicago paleontologist Paul Serino stumbled upon a large human graveyard possibly dating as far back as 10,000 years. It turned out to be the largest known Saharan cemetery, containing the remains of fish, crocodiles, and other creatures in addition to around 200 humans. Evidence suggests that the site was inhabited during two distinct periods, with roughly 1,000 years in between. 
the groups that occupied the site, known as the Kiffians and Tenarians, left behind more than just their corpses. Artifacts relating to their daily lives, including harpoons, bone jewelry, and arrowheads, were discovered alongside the deceased. There were numerous bizarre burials as well, including a man whose head was placed in a pot and another who was laid to rest on top of a turtle shell, as well as a woman who was buried facing two children. The women and the two children were likely buried on top of a bed of flowers, as evidenced by pollen found in their graves. Even more bizarrely, the tools and animals at Gobero seemed out of place for the modern Sahara climate. This is because they originate from a time known as the period of the Green Sahara, also known as an African humid period, during which changes in the Earth's orbit brought more rain to the region, resulting in more vegetation, water, and life forms. The Taman Rasset River The Sahara Desert is the largest hot desert in the world where only the toughest wildlife can survive. But it wasn't always that way. Before the Sahara Desert was covered in nearly 3,630,000 square miles of sand, it was a humid, tropical region filled with lush vegetation and freshwater sources. Nobody knew really what was going on beneath the sand until 2015. That year, researchers studied satellite imagery that revealed evidence of a paleo river, remnants of an enormous, now inactive river system that once flowed through the dry and barren desert. This ancient river system can be found deep beneath the sands. Called the Taman Rasset River, it may have flowed through the Sahara as recently as 5,000 years ago. The river stretches over 323 miles. These channels are periodically reactivated during warmer climate cycles called African Human Periods, the most recent of which ended roughly 6,500 years ago. In this particular case, scientists believe the Paleo River system may be connected to fossil water sources and can help indicate where to find new water sources in the desert. In the meantime, scientists are keeping an eye out for what satellites find to hunt down more rivers. Libyan Desert Glass For over 3,000 years, fragments of canary yellow glass, known as Libyan Desert Glass, have been found between shifting sand dunes over a vast area of the Sahara Desert in western Egypt, near the Libyan border. The mysterious material was even incorporated into King Tut's gilded and jewel-covered breastplate in the form of a scarab beetle that serves as a centerpiece. For a long time, scientists didn't know exactly where Libyan desert glass came from. It's made of pure silica, which can only form in temperatures of 2,912 degrees Fahrenheit or more, a temperature that generally does not occur naturally anywhere near the Earth's surface posing the obvious question of how this happened before humans existed, and therefore without human intervention. The strange substance's origins were finally discovered last year, according to a 2019 study published in the journal Geology, which asserts that the material formed around 29 million years ago following a meteorite impact. Included in the research is the first known evidence of the collision in the form of high-pressure damage from the event. Scientists reached this conclusion based on the presence of a mineral called redite that is present in Libyan desert glass. Redite only forms during a meteorite impact, as evidenced by its presence only being reported at sites of this nature, meaning the substance could have only come to exist under that particular circumstance. Despite these findings, researchers have a lot left to learn about Libyan desert glass, including where the crater is located and how big it is. Monster Croc Dinosaurs weren't the only animals that favored the marine habitats once offered by the Sahara. In 2016, scientists discovered evidence of the largest ever sea-dwelling crocodile in modern-day Tunisia. Their findings, which appeared in 120 million-year-old rock, were published in the journal Cretaceous Research. Does anyone read this? Let me know in the comments below. The creature, named Machimosaurus rex for its formidable size, grew up to 30 feet long and weighed as much as 3 tons. It hailed from an ancient crocodilian lineage of species who spent nearly their entire lives at sea. Only a skull and a few other bones were recovered, leaving experts with a lot of guesswork in terms of determining the true size of Machimosaurus rex. But the region in which they were found has not really been explored, leaving hope that more complete remains will be unearthed in the future. The species had larger freshwater relatives, but boasted the distinction of being the largest ocean-dwelling member of the crocodilian family tree. Machimosaurus rex was originally one of several species thought to have died out during a mass extinction around 145 million years ago, during the Jurassic period. But the discovery of its bones in much newer rock suggests that the creature survived the extinction event and that the event was not as far-reaching as scientists once believed. 
Nabta Stones A series of stones known as the Nabta Playa Stone Circle, located in modern-day southern Egypt, marks an area that flooded seasonally thousands of years ago, forming a lake and attracting Neolithic nomadic tribes, who set up camp at the site. Roughly 6,000 years ago, the Nabta people erected the Nabta Playa Stone Circle, consisting of a series of stones measuring 12 feet in diameter. The arrangement predates Stonehenge by 1,000 years and is the earliest known astronomically aligned structure, although exactly what it aligns with in the night sky is unknown. Astrophysicist Thomas G. Brophy suggested that several of the stones point toward the Orion's Belt constellation, but this theory remains to be proven. Early people used the site between 9,000 and 6,000 years ago for feeding and watering their livestock, and evidence also suggests that they sacrificed animals there. Known as the Nabta people, the society underwent a significant change around 7,500 years ago, at which time they began sacrificing cows, sheep, and goats. The adoption of this practice coincided with a level of social organization previously unseen in the region. Numerous underground chambers discovered in the area contained the remains of animals who were ritualistically slaughtered and buried. Lake Mega Chad A freshwater body called Lake Mega Chad once occupied a roughly 139,000 square mile area of the Sahara Desert in Central Africa, making it the largest freshwater lake on Earth at the time. In the words of the British scientist who made the discovery in 2015, a reconstructed lake-level history for the ancient Lake Mega Chad, once the largest lake in Africa, suggests that a North African humid period with increased precipitation in the Sahara region ended abruptly around 5,000 years years ago, and that the lake's Bodel Basin, now a large source of atmospheric dust, may not have dried out until around 1,000 years ago. Dust from the dried-out lake began blowing across the Atlantic and fertilizing the Amazon rainforest around that time, 1,000 years ago, leaving experts with the quandary of how the rainforest received nutrients before then. Today, all that's left of Lake Mega Chad is Lake Chad, occupying just 137 square miles. It occupies parts of Chad, Niger, Nigeria, and Cameroon, and was reduced to its current size mainly by humans overusing it as a freshwater source. The lake's dried up remains make up the Bodel Depression, the world's largest source of dust. This dust is imperative to the health of the Amazon rainforest, where nutrients are quickly washed from the soil and need ample regular replenishing. But where the rainforest acquired nutrients before the Bodel Depression existed starting 1,000 years ago remains unknown. Lost Libyan Civilization There's more to the Sahara Desert's hidden secrets than ancient bodies of water. Satellite photographs released in 2011 show over 100 fortresses or castles belonging to a so-called lost civilization that once inhabited southwestern Libya. These settlements, which date back between 1 and 500 AD, were inhabited by a mysterious but advanced people called the Garamantes. However, under Gaddafi, they remained unrecorded and unexplored. After the fall of his regime, archaeologists could now go in person. An early 2011 expedition to the fortresses, located roughly 600 and 20 miles south of the Libyan capital of Tripoli, yielded pottery samples confirming the Garamantes' former occupation. During the trip, archaeologists noticed the ancient structure's stunning state of preservation. At first glance, the ruins resemble something of a Roman nature, but project leader David Mattingly said, actually, this is beyond the frontiers of the Roman Empire. These sites are markers of a powerful native African kingdom. There are mud brick remains of castle-like complexes with high walls, ancient homes, cemeteries, and advanced irrigation systems, enabling them to grow plants in the middle of the desert. Knowledge of the Garamantes is limited, not only because of civil strife in Libya, but by the country's limited budget for archaeological research. So far, experts have deducted that this remarkable civilization had their own writing system, high-quality textiles, and metallurgy. With satellite imagery, archaeologists can study a large area and can see that it was once densely populated. These oasis farmers are far from the barbaric nomads painted by the Romans. The Romans fought several battles against the armies of chariots and cavalry of the Garamantes, who were famous horsemen. Rock carvings depict different kinds of soldiers that famously gave the Romans a hard time. For some mysterious reason, the Garamantian civilization began to decline in the 5th century and then disappeared. Valley of the Whales As you now know, the Sahara Desert contained vast bodies of water on and off throughout history. Included among these was the Tethys Ocean, which existed tens of millions of years ago. 
Then the ocean dried up and became the desert. Remnants of creatures that dwelled within the Tethys Ocean dating back 37 million years have been found in the arid modern-day landscape at the Wadi al-Hitan paleontological site in Egypt, also known as the Valley of the Whales. One such animal, the Scylosaurus, was a prehistoric whale that reached up to 50 feet long and had two delicate and useless hind legs. Paleontologist Philip Gingrich found a complete specimen, extremely well preserved. These legs are left over from land mammals that once walked on all fours and for some reason decided to return to the ocean. He says that complete specimens like the Bacillosaurus are Rosetta stones that tell us a complete story of how the animal lived. Over 1,000 ancient whales have been discovered at Wadi al-Hitan, and many more likely remain buried under the desert sand. These creatures could help scientists understand how whales made an apparent evolutionary U-turn, as National Geographic's Tom Mueller calls it. Simply put, terrestrial creatures evolved from aquatic animals that made their way to land where it was easier to breathe and live. Some of these species somehow made their way back into the water, and their land-designated body parts, like legs, lost their purpose. While this apparent reversion back to marine life is a fascinating feature among sea-dwelling mammals, scientists have yet to properly situate these creatures in the evolutionary family tree. Where do you put a whale with legs? Prehistoric Mega Lake In 2010, scientists discovered evidence of a prehistoric mega lake that formed around 250,000 years ago and spanned a more than 42,000 square mile area of the eastern Sahara Desert at its peak. Researchers made the find by analyzing radar data of Egypt and creating a profile of the ancient mega lake using images of wind-blown sediments, sediments produced by running water, and bedrock beneath the sand. Using fish remains as a marker for the lake's highest shoreline, they estimated that the Nile River once flooded Egypt's Kaseba Tushka depression entirely. At its largest, the ancient water body likely extended some 250 miles west of the Nile and sat at 810 feet above sea level. The scientists placed Paleolithic settlements close to what they believe were the lake's borders, representing desirable near-water locations. Other archaeological sites suggest that the lake was smaller at one time, occupying roughly 18,600 square miles and sitting at around 623 feet above sea level. The existence of lakes across North Africa during the early and middle Pleistocene epoch could have heavily influenced human migration patterns, thus playing a vital role in our collective history which experts are still trying to piece together. Gorgonopsia At just 6 to 10 feet long, members of the extinct Gorgonopsis genus were not exactly intimidating based on their size. Hailing from the Gorgonopsia suborder, these medium-sized therapsids ranked among the dominant predators of what is now South Africa during the late Permian, around 260 million years ago. Gorgonops rose to the top of the food chain thanks to its speed, viciousness, and massive canine teeth measuring up to four inches long, which came in handy for effortlessly penetrating prey. It also had the advantage of having legs that supported its weight from directly below, rather than sprawling out to the sides, like many creatures of its day, making for better speed and energy efficiency. One of the best studied Gorgonopsians is the Lycanops, an animal about three feet long whose name means wolf face. Like a wolf, it was long and slender with giant sharp teeth, similar to the saber-toothed cats so they could stab and tear at large prey. Gorgonopsians were wiped off the globe during the end Permian extinction around 252 million years ago. It was the most severe such event in the world's history, with little to no warning signs leading up to the massive and seemingly sudden die-off of 96% of the planet's marine species and around 70% of its terrestrial creatures. Thalato Archon Thalato Archon, a type of marine reptile called an ichthyosaur, lived around 240 44 million years ago during the Triassic, this creature ate prey its own size and was about the size of a bus. Thalato archon sarophagus, which was discovered in Nevada in 1997, existed near the beginning of a long-lasting time span dominated by large apex marine predators. National Geographic calls it the first ruler of the Triassic Seas. Another mega-predator ichthyosaur was the 240-million-year-old Gizu ichthyosaurus, discovered in 2010. A 15-foot fossil was discovered with a 12-foot-long thalatosaur in its stomach. It was quite the mega-predator of the ocean back in its day. 
But back to the Thalato Archon. Unlike most other ichthyosaurs who had simple conical teeth, the Lato Archon had double-edged, blade-like teeth, with its largest tooth measuring four inches long. Its teeth would be comparable to orcas or great whites today. It also had large eyes set into a large head, which was roughly twice as big in ratio to its body compared to other ichthyosaurs. The Lato Archon's formidable size and terrifying teeth likely ranked it as an apex predator among other ichthyosaurs during a time when land-dwelling reptiles were migrating to the sea in mass and adapting to marine life. It was especially well suited to the sea, having emerged into existence just 8 million years after the world's worst known mass extinction known as the End Permian Event. Scientists point toward the creature's adaptability as a sign that marine life bounced back impressively fast after the extinction compared to terrestrial life. After the event, the ocean was a pretty empty place, but apparently not for long, and ecosystems were intact by the time the ichthyosaur came around. The Lato Archon and its relatives thrived for 160 million years, but went extinct for unknown reasons. Liopleurodon The Liopleurodon genus of extinct marine reptiles encompassed two species that may very well qualify as some of the mightiest marine creatures of all time. These apex predators lived between 165 and 155 million years ago, during the late Jurassic period in what is now France, where there was once a shallow body of water perfect for the creature. The larger of the Liopleurodon species, L. ferox, reached an estimated 16 to 23 feet, with the largest known specimen likely measuring over 33 feet long. The species' weight probably ranged between 2,200 pounds and 3,700 pounds. It's difficult to definitively measure the creature's length, however, because researchers only have so much to work with in terms of fossilized remains. With four large, flipper-like limbs, the Liopleurodon was a strong swimmer that was capable of quickly accelerating, acting as a major advantage for the ambush predator when it came to pursuing prey. But these sea monsters were not infallible. The Liopleurodon and other pliosaurs ultimately lost the battle for survival to the Mosasaurs, a newer, more adept, and deadlier type of reptile. Phoberomus patersoni While prehistoric marine predators are terrifying for obvious reasons, it would be relatively easy to avoid one. After all, all you'd have to do is stay out of the water. But there may be no escaping from Phoberomus patersoni, one of the world's largest extinct rodents, which measured up to 9.8 feet long and weighed between 550 and 1,540 pounds, with a standing height of around 4.2 feet. Related to modern-day guinea pigs, the creature existed around 8 million years ago in South America's Orinoco Delta, which includes areas of Venezuela and Colombia. While this ratzilla was herbivorous, its appearance is nonetheless terrifying, especially to those who suffer from a phobia of rodents. There are also plenty of herbivores that can hurt you, like hippos and elephants, if they want to run you over. Just because they don't eat you doesn't mean they can't defend themselves. Like the modern-day capybara, P. Patersoni was semi-aquatic and likely foraged for food along riverbanks, according to University of Leeds researcher R. McNeil. While the creature's large size may seem abnormal to the average Joe, it confuses scientists for the exact opposite reason. The question that puzzles me is not how Phoberomus could have been so large, but why the overwhelming majority of rodents are so small, a researcher said. Seen from a distance, it would have looked much more like a buffalo than like a scaled-up guinea pig. Pliosaurus spunkae In 2012, scientists announced a newly named Jurassic-era marine reptile species, Pliosaurus spunkae, which swam through the world's oceans around 150 million years ago. Fossils of two specimens discovered in Svalbard, Norway, indicate that it was a massive apex predator during its time, possibly measuring around 40 feet long and equipped with a six-and-a-half-foot-long skull that had four times the bite force of a Tyrannosaurus rex. Knowing exactly how big the creatures were is a difficult measurement to calculate because scientists only have incomplete and partial pliosaur skeletons to base their determinations off of. Plus, with such limited evidence to work from, it's equally difficult for experts to truly know the animal's bite force. The species' ferociousness remains rather clear, however. They were the top predators of the sea, study co-author Patrick Druckenmiller told Live Science. They had teeth that would have made a T-Rex whimper. Pliosaurus spunkae shared the ocean with other gigantic marine reptiles, including other pliosaurs, defined by their short necks 
tear-shaped bodies, massive heads, and four flippers. Liviaton Melville Liviaton Melville was a legendary whale of prehistoric times that was a ferocious predator of the oceans. Growing to between 45 and 60 feet in length, these terrifying whales ate other whales and megalodons. Remains that have been found of Liviaton Melville show that it lived in the world's oceans about 13 million years ago during the Miocene epoch. During that time, the ocean was full of huge and varied species that provided the Liviaton with plenty to feast on. It would, however, have had a mighty foe in the waters in the form of the Megalodon. It is believed that these creatures overlapped at some point and lived at around the same time. The Megashark was a similar size to the Liviaton, and while it's thought unlikely that the two would have hunted each other often, it's quite possible that they came up against one another in the pursuit of prey. Most experts think that the Liviaton would have come out victorious if this ever happened. They had giant teeth about 15 inches long, perfectly placed for grabbing and ripping out flesh. T-Rex teeth in comparison would reach up to 12 inches, saber-toothed teeth grew to 11 inches, and the largest megalodon teeth that have ever been found are just under 8 inches long. Sarcosuchus Even the most gargantuan modern crocodilians would look small next to Sarcosuchus, the largest crocodile that ever roamed the earth. It lived in northern Africa during the early Cretaceous period, between 133 and 112 million years ago, a time when the Sahara Desert was tropical and lush with vegetation and numerous rivers and water bodies. Nicknamed the Super Croc, this prehistoric reptile grew continuously throughout its lifetime, with the biggest specimens reaching a length of up to 40 feet and weighing as much as 10 tons. As an apex predator, Sarcosuchus was capable of snapping the neck of Spinosaurus, the largest terrestrial carnivorous dinosaur of the time, leaving it with no shortage of food despite sharing its habitat with many other ancient super-sized reptiles. It subsisted mostly on fish, however, and it was probably rare for a super croc to feast on a dinosaur, but hey, who knows? Sarcosuchus was a philidosaur, a prehistoric type of reptile that went extinct millions of years ago for unclear reasons, making it a distant relative of today's crocodilians. Mosasaurus Mosasaurs are an extinct group of aquatic reptiles that roamed the planet alongside the dinosaurs during the late Cretaceous period, between 82 and 66 million years ago. They're not exactly dinosaurs, and they were extremely deadly. These unforgiving marine monsters drove at least one other reptile group, the ichthyosaurs, to extinction by outcompeting them for food, and they may have played a role in eradicating plesiosaurs and pliosaurs. Their fossils often appear inland, where bodies of waters once existed, including the interior Great Sea which covered a large portion of the American Midwest. Mosasaurus, the largest of the Mosasaurs, measured up to 60 feet long and weighed up to 15 tons, although experts are unsure of its exact size range. It had a ferocious set of teeth, ideal for shredding prey like fish, birds, and other marine reptiles, and a second set of teeth further inside its mouth, acting as a secondary safeguard to stop prey from escaping in the moments before they were devoured. Resembling a crocodile with fins, the Mosasaurus was a top predator in the waters of its day. But like other prehistoric creatures before them, Mosasaurs were not immune to competition. The creatures were wiped out in the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event that killed all the dinosaurs. But if this hadn't happened, it's believed that their downfall may have otherwise been large largely perpetuated by faster, more vicious, and smarter ancient sharks like the Jinsu shark. These sharks would later evolve to include the enormous Megalodon. Terror Birds Terror birds emerged into existence around 60 million years ago, before Central America formed and when South America was an island, and roughly 5 million years after the extinction that wiped out the dinosaurs. This family of carnivorous, flightless birds encompassed 17 species, which ranked among the region's largest apex predators, ranging in height from 3 to 10 feet. Included among the scariest terror birds was the Brontornis genus, which grew to 9.2 feet tall and weighed between 700 170 and 880 pounds. Terror birds are best known for their large, sharp beaks, which were capable of inflicting sufficient damage by pecking or stabbing something really hard with enough power to sever a spinal cord. They also had piercing talons, which they used for kicking and holding down prey as they ripped their guts out. BBC reports that Titanus was as big and fast as an ostrich, with feet that could snap the femur of a cow. A peck from this bird could knock your head off. 
They were at the top of the food chain in South America for tens of millions of years, and then everything changed. Terror birds declined and eventually went extinct, following the emergence of the Isthmus of Panama around 2.7 million years ago, which connected North and South America and enabled other predators like bears, wolves, and toothed cats to come into their territory and hunt them. Bacillosaurus Between 41.3 and 33.9 million years ago during the late Eocene epoch, a prehistoric whale genus called Bacillosaurus lived throughout the Tethys Sea and other water bodies of the ancient world. These early marine mammals were members of a primitive group of cetaceans called Archaeoceti and were top predators in their environments. There are two known Bacillosaurus species. Fossils of one species, B. cetoides, were first discovered along the U.S. Gulf Coast, with others being found in the eastern U.S. Evidence of the second species, B. isis, has appeared in North Africa, including Jordan, Egypt, Morocco, and Tunisia, and possibly even Antarctica. Bacillosaurus was perhaps the largest creature of its time period, reaching up to 60 feet long, with a 3-foot-long skull that had a bite force comparable to a T-Rex. The study of the ancient whale's stomach contents revealed that it was, indeed, a formidable and fearsome force in its habitat, feasting on fish and sharks measuring up to 20 inches long. Bite marks on the skull fossils of smaller whales also bear evidence that Bacillosaurus preyed on other cetaceans, including specimens from the Dorodon genus. Bacillosaurus likely went extinct around 34 million years ago during the Eocene Oligocene extinction event, which was small compared to some of history's other extinctions, but saw the eradication of many marine creatures, including the last surviving Archaeoceti. Chronosaurus With specimens measuring 30 to 36 feet long and weighing between 7 and 10 tons, the extinct Chronosaurus genus encompassed some of the prehistoric world's largest pliosaurs, a fearsome type of dinosaur with a short neck, large head, broad body, and massive toothed jaws. Members of this genus inhabited early Cretaceous waters between 120 and 100 million years ago. There were two known species including K. queenslandicus, found in New South Wales and Queensland, Australia, as well as K. boyacensis, which was discovered in Colombia. However, scientists believe that Chronosaurus may have had a worldwide presence and that its remains simply haven't been discovered on other continents yet. Chronosaurus was one of the deadliest marine reptiles that ever existed. It was closely related to the Liopleurodon, with the two bearing striking similarities despite existing some 40 million years apart. Like its earlier relative, Chronosaurus had deceptively sharp-looking teeth. In reality, the animal's power came from its powerful bite, which enabled it to shake and crush prey to death in its mouth, as well as its fast swimming speed. Chronosaurus fed on fellow marine reptiles, including members of the Aeromangosaurus genus, as evidenced by fossils containing the predator's bite marks. Pliosaurs, in general, were severely weakened by the evolution of creatures better suited to survive in their habitat, including sharks, and a reptile family known as the Mosasaurus. By the time the mass extinction event that wiped out the dinosaurs rolled around roughly 65 million years ago, pliosaurs were virtually eradicated from the planet. Vampire of Venice in 2009, archaeologists revealed the discovery of the remains of a female vampire in a 16th century mass grave of plague victims near Venice, Italy. Originally found in 2006 on the Venetian island of Lazaretto Nuovo, a brick was jammed into the woman's jaw, forcing her mouth open. Archaeologists were pretty shocked. They had heard stories of this type of thing, but there had never been such blatant proof. This was an exorcism technique that was practiced on suspected vampires in Europe at the time. It was the first ever discovery of human remains that appeared to represent an alleged vampire. A few years before being found, forensic archaeologist Matteo Barini from the University of Florence led a study to learn more about the woman's identity, why she was suspected of being a vampire, and what she looked like. They determined that the woman was between 61 and 71 years old. She ate mostly vegetables and grains, indicating that she was probably lower class and likely lived a rather ordinary life. Her age was rather shocking, as most European women during the Middle Ages didn't live nearly that long. At the time, many people believed strongly in vampires. This notion was partially fueled by a dark fluid that flowed from the nose and mouth of corpses during the decomposition process. When gravediggers reopened mass burials to add the bodies of newly deceased plague sufferers, they may have mistaken this fluid as the blood of vampire victims. Burial shrouds sometimes became soaked with the fluid and sank into the mouths of dead bodies, making them appear as if they had chewed on the cloth. Soon enough, vampires were blamed for causing the plague. 
By inserting objects into corpses' mouths, people believed that it stopped the spread of the deadly disease and would prevent vampires from being able to eat. Since the Vampire of Venice was discovered, others have been found, including one that was unearthed in Poland in 2014. While vampires are not real per se, you can imagine how discovering decomposing bodies hundreds of years ago would have been pretty spooky, especially if you knew nothing about science or biology. Back then, vampires were real. Books Bound in Human Skin in 2014, scientists determined that a book found in Harvard called Destinies of the Soul was bound in human skin. The study concluded that the literary work was likely covered with the flesh of an unidentified female mental patient who died of natural causes. Written by French novelist Arsène Hossayer, the book ended up in the hands of the author's friend, Dr. Ludovic Boland, during the 1880s. Um, I don't know about you, but this is not the type of gift that I want. Dr. Boulam proceeded to bind the book in human skin, a process known as anthropodermic bibliopegy, which dates as far back as the 19th century, and likely before then. I guess I just don't appreciate this type of hobby, but there are three books made of skin found in libraries at Harvard alone. Another example of a book bound with a person's flesh is owned by the Bristol Record Office and is covered in the skin of 18-year-old John Horwood, the first man to be hanged at Bristol Jail. The disturbing work contains details of Horwood's crime, the murder of a woman named Eliza Balsam. Infamous murderer William Burke's skin was used for binding a small brown pocketbook following his execution in 1829, and in a disturbing twist, is stamped with his death date. There are no pages contained within the appalling artifact, which would have been used for storing money and other personal effects, like a wallet. And how the man's skin came to be used for its manufacture remains a mystery to this day. There was a public dissection and it was reported that part of the skin went missing and then soon after this book turned up for sale in Edinburgh, Emma Black from the Royal College of Surgeons told the BBC. The production of this book followed a trend in which body parts of executed criminals were considered to be a type of talisman. Numerous other criminal skin was reportedly used for bookbinding, including that of George Cudmore, a rat catcher and murderer from Devon, England, who was hanged in 1830 after he was convicted of killing his wife. Cudmore's flesh was used to cover an 1852 copy of the poetical works of John Milton. The creepy literary work went on display in February 2011 at the West Country Studies Library in Exeter. Although public records confirm that Cudmore's body was dissected after his execution, how and why samples of his skin were kept long enough to bind a book remains an ongoing mystery. Quite clearly, someone held onto the biological material for several decades until they decided to engage in the uncommon, I guess yet not unusual practice of anthropodermic bibliophagy. Altamura Man The Altamura Man is a Neanderthal that had provided us with the oldest known Neanderthal DNA ever to be extracted. The poor man's skeletal remains were found in a limestone cave in Altamura, Italy, fused to the limestone walls, leaving a horrific skull emerging from the bumpy, crystallized wall. He appears to have fallen into a 26-foot sinkhole and most likely got severely hurt. Now stuck and alone, he is believed to have died from starvation between 128,000 and 187,000 years ago. Over the thousands of years, his bones became covered in calcite and fused with the cave wall. Because archaeologists believe that removing the remains would damage them, the complete skeleton remains at the site where it was discovered. Scientists extracted a bone fragment for analysis, which they used to obtain a DNA sample. In 2016, researchers reconstructed a highly realistic model of the Neanderthal's face and body. He was short, with a large nose, a protruding jawline, and an elongated cranium. While the individual's body was characteristic of other Neanderthal remains scientists have discovered, his head was shaped slightly differently. It shows archaic traits, making the Altamora man a sort of morphological bridge between the previous human species, Homo heidelbergensis, and the Neanderthals, said paleontologist Giorgio Manzi, who was part of the team that successfully extracted DNA from the skeleton. The Altamura man lived during the late middle to early late Pleistocene period, around 150,000 years ago, and Neanderthals existed between 200,000 and roughly 40,000 years ago. This unique skeleton is considered a regional treasure, and locals hope that it will be the key to scientific research and inspire the protection of their heritage and history. Mummified Lung 
1959, archaeologist Michael Fleury found a preserved lung inside a stone sarcophagus in the Basilica of Saint Denis in Paris, the burial site of many French kings. Buried along with the lung were a skeleton, jewelry, textiles, and leather fragments, and a strand of hair. But whose were they? The remains belonged to the Merovingian Queen Arnegund, one of King Clotaire's six wives and the mother of King Chilperic. She lived roughly between 515 and 580, and her burial was identified based on a gold ring bearing the inscription Arnegundis. Queen Arnegund's lung raised numerous questions that perplexed experts for decades, including whether it somehow mummified naturally or if it was deliberately embalmed. The fact that it was the only preserved part of her otherwise skeletonized body made the matter even more mysterious. In 2016, an international team of researchers led by bioanthropologist Raffaella Bianucci determined that the lung's remarkably preserved state likely results from a copper belt Arnegun's corpse wore when she was buried. The decayed belt deposited large concentrations of copper oxide throughout the lung, which the scientists detected during biopsies, and this had an embalming effect on the organ. They also determined that the queen's body was injected with a fluid made from a mixture of spices and aromatic plants, which also likely contributed to the lung's preservation. Murder Island Mass Grave In 1629, a Dutch merchant vessel called the Batavia ran aground on a small coral island roughly 37 miles off the Australian coast. Around 60 people out of the 341 souls aboard were lost in the wreck, while another 280 or so sought refuge on Beacon Island, which has since been nicknamed Murder Island. As part of an effort to learn more about the circumstances surrounding the disaster, archaeologists discovered a communal grave containing the remains of five individuals on Murder Island in late 2017. This and other evidence shows that in the months following the Batavia's wreck, around 115 of the 280 survivors were murdered in a brutal mutiny. But the ship seemed doomed from the outset of its maiden voyage when it departed the Netherlands seeking spices from Indonesia, known as the Dutch East Indies at the time. It was one of seven vessels in a fleet, but it became separated from the convoy following a rough storm in the North Sea. At some point, a female passenger was assaulted, revealing the first signs of a possible mutiny. When the Batavia ran aground, its survivors sought shelter among several shallow islands. Sometime thereafter, the ship's third-in-command organized a mutiny of 40 men amid an increasingly scarce freshwater supply in an attempt to optimize their chances of survival. Merchant Geronimus Cornelis led the rebellion, commanding certain groups of people to seek resources on nearby islands, murdering others in a methodical and organized fashion. The communal grave that was discovered in 2017 appears to contain the remains of people who were laid to rest respectfully rather than hurriedly, suggesting that they were not victims of Cornelius' convoluted mutiny. Researchers theorized that they died shortly after the disaster and before the violence began. Experts hope to learn more about the deceased individuals through further analysis of their remains. Death Labyrinth While working at the 3,000-year-old Chavín de Huantar Temple in Peru in 2018, Scientists discovered a complex maze of underground tunnels, as well as three skeletons of humans who appeared to be killed during sacrifices. They made the fascinating find using tiny remote-controlled robots equipped with lights and cameras, which were designed by Stanford University engineers. Also included among the artifacts found in the tunnels are ceramic fragments and tools. Altogether, experts identified 35 interlocking tunnels dating back between 1200 and 200 BC. The human remains found inside were found to be those of a child, a teenager, and a young man between 20 and 30 years old. One of the skeletons was found face down, suggesting that the ill-fated individuals were perhaps sacrificed. John Rick, the project's director, said authorities and priests played with the architecture and carried out rituals with drugs, noise, and light manipulation that pilgrims could not explain and made them believe the leaders of Chavin had higher powers. The discovery was hailed as one of the most significant archaeological finds in the last half century. Cabayan Mummy Caves During the early 20th century, industrial loggers in the forest north of Manila, the capital city of the Philippines, discovered hundreds of coffins and human remains inside a series of ancient burial caves. The graves belonged to the Ibaloi tribe, who experts believe interred the remains between the years 1200 and 1500. 
Shortly before someone passed away, they drank a salty concoction to begin the mummification process. Once the person passed, their body was cleansed, prepared with herbs, and heated over a several-week period. As part of this regimen, the deceased individual was set over a fire in a seated position while tobacco smoke was blown into their mouth to dry their internal organs. Then the corpse was situated in a fetal position inside a decoratively carved oval-shaped wooden coffin. This practice ended following the arrival of the Spanish in 1500, and the burials remained undisturbed until they were rediscovered in the early 1900s. They were designated a national cultural treasure, but very little protection was extended to the burials, and looting and vandalism became major issues, among other naturally caused problems, such as fungal growth and insect infestation. For these reasons, the government has avoided publishing the exact location of the tombs. People still manage to find them, but the journey to the site is arduous, requiring a five-hour drive into the mountains, followed by a five-hour hike up a series of stone steps. Locals continue to pay respect to the mummies via prepared meals, which help to ensure that the deceased are well-fed in the afterlife. Shrieking Death Whistles One of the arguably most terrifying sounds a person might hear is that of the Aztec Shrieking Death Whistle which in the words of Reuben Westmas in a Discovery article, sounds like a screeching zombie. It is definitely a shriek of death. These creepy musical instruments may have been used for numerous purposes, including intimidation before or during battle, or perhaps for calling the gods for healing purposes and accompanying the dead into the afterlife. One thing archaeologists are sure of, however, is the fact that shrieking death whistles played a role in human sacrifices. During the 90s, Researchers in Mexico discovered the 500-year-old decapitated remains of a sacrificial victim who clung to a death whistle in his skeletal hands. It wasn't until years later that an archaeologist decided to blow into this strange object that was housed on a shelf. It emitted a high-pitched, death-like scream. There are different air streams generated within the structure of these instruments, which then diametrically hits against each other, music archaeologist Arndt Adjiboth told Gizmodo and thus the Aztecs were able to produce a very shrill and noisy sound. Imagine hundreds or even thousands of these screaming whistles sounding at once. The horrifying sound immediately captivates the imagination and takes you to a very dark place. Hundreds of Lost Sites Burned grass and dead crops are almost never a good thing, but a scorching heat wave that hit the UK and Ireland in 2018 revealed the presence of around 1,500 archaeological sites over a short, several-week span. The oldest among them date back roughly 5,000 years to the Neolithic period, while others are from as recent as the Tudor dynasty. Aerial archaeologists from historic England detected the sites by flying over them and identifying them among the heat-damaged landscape. Included among the discoveries are burial mounds, military structures, lost villages, ancient field boundaries, and a demolished Tudor hall and the outline of its intended replacement. Some of the sites were more recognizable than others, and some were downright perplexing or eerie. For example, one bizarre prehistoric settlement found in Cornwall is surrounded by concentric ditches, while a rare medieval cemetery was found in Wales, and other burial sites were discovered in Scotland and Ireland. So what's so scary about these newly found sites? For one, they all appeared very quickly and over a short time period. Secondly, they offer a glimpse into little-known parts of the region's past, including cemeteries, which are inherently creepy to begin with. Unfortunately, few of these sites will be excavated, but on the bright side, many are now protected from damaging activities such as deep plowing. Thanks for watching! Which discovery did you like the most? Let me know in the comments below and be sure to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. See you next time. Bye.